welcome back to my channel. Thank you all for your comments. I've tried to answer as many as I can in the comments box below, so check it out. I have replied to them. Um, I will try at some point to do a, another comments video as well, because I'm aware there were some other comments that I still need to try and answer. So I'll try and do that when I can. might be a bit wild, but I'll try and get there. So bear with me. Um, in this video, I wanted to talk to you about another article um, from 14th of February 2023, so this year, called Autism Severity and Its Relationship to Disability. And this was online library Wiley.com and the article was written by Deborah Fine, F-E-I-N, don't know how to pronounce that, Fine, Fine. And Catherine Lord, etc. So I'm just going to sort of like read out the main points and offer some of my own views, maybe. So the article says that autism severity is currently defined based exclusively on severity levels of two core symptom domains social communication and restricted or repetitive patterns of behaviours and interests. So that's how autism severity is currently defined, quite narrowly by the core criteria of autism. Presumably, um, someone could be fairly mild in one of those domains, but severe in the other, and then conjoined, they both create the person quite severe. I'm not sure exactly how it works, because obviously they're two separate dimensions. Someone could be severe in both, someone could be severe in one, someone could be pretty mild in the other. They can interact in all sorts of different ways to affect the presentation and the person's overall impairment. But often, the person is diagnosed with other conditions. For example, intellectual disability, which is known in the UK as a sort of a generic learning disability, language disorders, anxiety, and etc. And that's just some of the co occurring conditions. And these can have a tremendous impact on adaptive functioning. Sometimes even more so than the core presentation or the core features. The initial presentation of the core symptoms and the likelihood of those core symptoms changing over time is influenced by the presence of co-occurring conditions. Okay, so what that means, I think, is that basically if you have a co-occurring condition, the presentation of your autism is going to look different to say if you don't have a co-occurring condition. Which kind of stands to reason, I suppose. That might be why those with ADHD and autism often have quite a different presentation to those who don't have ADHD, or at least not to a clinical level. Bearing in mind, most autistics have at least some traits. Um, and obviously if you also have OCD or a general anxiety disorder, that might make you come across as even more rigid possibly, and routinised than you would if you didn't have anxiety as well. So, yes, it can affect the autism presentation, the co-occurring conditions. So it can be very hard to disentangle what is what. Maybe it doesn't really matter anyway. You know, maybe it's just a fool's errand trying to disentangle what belongs to exclusively to autism, what belongs exclusively to the other condition, because obviously in the brain it's just one kind of mess, isn't it? They all come together, they all conjoin in the brain. You know, I guess it's sort of psychiatric conceit trying to kind of which is important for sort of diagnostics, but beyond that, it doesn't really offer much help, I don't think. So what's important is where the person is at and giving them the support they need. Um, yeah, and obviously, and obviously the likelihood of changing over time is also influenced by the presence of co occurring conditions as well, as I've just said. So in order to truly understand how a person's autism impacts their life, both the core symptoms, as well as the other challenges, should be considered. Yeah, so in other words, you shouldn't consider the core autism features kind of in a silo, 
sort of, um, as it were, sort of, you know, in a box, kind of, you know, a vacuum, as it were, without taking into account all of those other conditions and symptoms that can interact with the core to have an overall impact on the person's quality of life. So the approach, for example, the approach taken by the Lancet Commission on the future of care and clinical research in autism proposed the term profound autism for a subgroup presenting with a high core symptom severity <laughs> along with co-occurring intellectual disability and little or no language who require extensive long-term care. So they would be people, yeah, who basically need a carer with them all the time. Like, they can't be left alone. They have to have a carer with them all the time. They can't do basic tasks. They can't toilet themselves, for example. Some, I mean, it depends on the severity, obviously, of the intellectual disability and the co-occurring conditions. But, yeah, they can't be left alone. Like a young child, really. They need someone with them all the time. It's very profound. Um, and you could say, well, it's a bit of a mute point, you know, what's the effect of the awesome or what's the effect of intellectual disability? You could say that's a mute point because it all kind of comes together to create this very profound picture. Um, yeah. So a comprehensive outlook that acknowledges impairments, capabilities and co-occurring conditions is useful for identifying subgroups. Yeah, I think that's very important. And actually, I would say that going forward, when they are look, trying to find out subgroups, um, it, I think it is important to look at the so-called comorbids. Comorbids is quite a problematic term, so that's why I'm using air quotes. Um, you know, because, like I said before, the brain doesn't operate according to nice, neat boxes. The brain doesn't think, oh, this part's autism. Oh, this part's OCD. You know, the brain kind of operates as one thing. Um... So, I, yeah, I do think there are subgroups that, that need to take into account these um, symptoms that aren't exclusively seen in autism. Or, sorry, aren't um, symptoms that aren't um, part of the autism criteria, I mean. Um, like, they've already, some people have already proposed, like, an ADHD autism synergy. I think it's called um, Aut ADHD or something. And that could be a meaningful subgroup. Although, even within that, there's likely to be micro subgroups, even within that, you know particularly depending on whether a person has attention deficit or more hyperactive. Um, but I think there are, there are also likely to be subgroups for those who have like OCD, like paediatric onset OCD and how that kind of creates a synergistic relationship with the autism as well. I think that could be a meaningful subgroup too. Um, and so on and so on and so on. So based on the current DSM-5 criteria, that's the latest Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders criteria, 2013, autism includes three levels of severity, ranging from requiring support to requiring very substantial support, which would be level three, the highest. I would say I'm probably, yeah, I must be about level two because I do need quite a lot of support but obviously not as much as someone who is level three like I don't need someone with me all the time obviously um <laughs> but I do need like a lot more support than just a little bit of support because like my dad does so much for me and when he can no longer do that I'm going to need all of that done by a support worker and yeah there's a lot of support I need um it's more than just a little bit of support I would say probably most people who have social care needs or have been assessed as eligible for social care probably are at least level two by definition um, it's not, yeah, that for levels is all based upon, like, essentially how much support you need. That's what the levels are based on, by the way. Um, so now, judgments of severity, so that, yeah. So, judgments of severity is based solely on the characteristics of the two core domains that make up the diagnosis of autism. Okay. So the first domain is the social domain. So that's, say, for example, failure to use eye contact and social interactions, but lack a back and forth reciprocal quality. And the second domain is the RRBs, which is the repetitive um, behaviours, routines, interests, and so on. 
And that can evolve at one extreme, maybe hand flapping, to the other being an intense preoccupation with highly specific objects or topics. Obviously, someone could engage in hand flapping and a highly specific interest as well. Um, that's not a binary, by the way. Um, and while clinicians, and also, of course, you know, very intense uh, need to follow routines also comes under that as well. While clinicians also specify if there is accompanying intellectual or language impairment, these features are not commonly integrated into the overall judgment of severity. Because, as I say, according to the diagnostic criteria, severity is all about the core autism domains. Um, now, obviously, if someone also has an intellectual disability, it's likely they're going to score more severely on the core autism domains, almost by default, because the intellectual disability conjoined with the autism is going to make the autism appear more severe. Um, but, but you don't have to be... According to this, you couldn't, in theory, you could not have an intellectual disability. You could be highly verbal and still be classed as being quite severely ASD because this is basically completely just related to the core autism features. Um, and so, and either is, and the other co uh, common co occurring conditions such as sleep difficulties. Um, epilepsy is also not included um, in the overall judgment of severity as well because they're seen as like separate sort of comorbids if you like. Um, okay so I'm, I'm going to move over to video number two now because I just want to carry on discussing this article so moving over to video number two.